we, the time we reached the 1980s, we're back into this urban revitalization thing. This is going on all over the country. Uh, your husband would have been mayor, Neil, uh, and we would have seen all over the country this impulse now to say, well, wait a minute, our buildings are falling in, uh, things are occurring, and we don't want to just knock them down and make way for new stuff. And by the way, bypasses are going to get built constantly now, right? Every city's going to get one. Did you? When was yours built? You, so you guys are late comers. What did you all lay down in front of the bulldozers? Or wow. Okay. I guess that's true. I hadn't thought of that. That's true. Yeah, that, well, that's a whole other piece of the story. Yeah, that goes back to the 1960s impulse, urban renewal, all of that. You're right. Well, that's interesting. Okay, so but you do have a bypass, and I'm sure you make good use of it, right? But we know then they start to affect bypasses especially and sprawl begin to affect urban townships where even up to the 1980s you probably had something of a thriving downtown. I would imagine this place did. Uh, and as a result, there's this impulse kicks back in to say we have to preserve what we have. Right? We have to protect it. And, and so we begin to see zoning apparatus laid out all over the country that begin to uh, protect by way of ordinances and regulations um, historic areas. And it was 1985 that you all got your city ordinance for the um, historic district. So let's talk about that a second. <clears throat> what is the historic district? It started out then in the 1970s with an impulse to document the downtown. And so you had a team of preservation specialists that came out, they documented this, and they drafted a National Register nomination, and I think in 1978 this got listed in the National Register of Historic Places, and it's basically the core of your commercial area, so therefore it's a commercial district. By the time Neil Hack Hackworth, when did he become mayor? 1980. 83. Well, by the time he was serving as mayor, there became then uh, one, two, three, four, four more National Register districts that got laid out and nominated and listed in the National Register uh, in Shelbyville. So this is the quilt you begin to see uh, stitched together. And somewhere in there, I don't know who all did this, they decided to say, well, let's make an ordinance and let's put a zoning overlay over top then of all of these districts. They left this little piece out here. I have no idea why. Neil could say, or maybe one of you all, and they extended it rightly so down to um, near uh, the horse, help me out there, fairgrounds, uh, horse park, what do you call it? Fairgrounds. Fairgrounds, thank you. You can see I was struggling with that. So that today what we have is this, right? The historic district. And I know it got expanded to include, there was an amendment to it to include some areas down here on Clay Street and all that. And at somewhere near that, when did your all's uh, Main Street program start? It started, Lucy was on about, about the same time. That's what I would have guessed, but I didn't know. So I just guessed and I said afterwards, but uh, right around that same time, right, Main Streets are coming on. Sure. And uh, so that's what you have. And so when we say, now, what, what is historic preservation? Remember, that's our, our core question here. I really haven't given you a definitive answer. I'm pointing out what you all have put in place as historic preservation. So it's one mechanism right now that we're talking about. Uh, <clears throat> remember, we've come through the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I would say that now, if you bring it up to today, what is historic preservation? I argue and have taught it from this standpoint. I don't know if you all know that or not. I taught this stuff in graduate program at the University of Kentucky. Uh, this is how I teach it. And that's quite different from the ways in which the 1960s people envisioned it. Right? It's not about materials conservation or other such things. It's a tool for planning. This might be why I got hired. Because when I gave, uh, I got to meet Neil and the mayor and Sherry Gelsma, which was interesting. Uh, this is my speech, right? Because this is how I see it, a tool for planning. And what is it that you're planning for? To control change in a meaningful way, right? Because anybody that thinks you're gonna freeze all of this in time 
and it's just going to look like your little picture of 1980, I mean, 1885, right? That's myth making. It doesn't work, right? And, and Walt Disney did it, but he even embellished it quite a bit and made an industry out of it, right? It will change. And the question is, how is it going to change? Are you going to just sit and ignore it while people put their grill um, vent and their thing on the facade? That'd look real nice, wouldn't it? Uh, this sign that looks like it fell from outer space. It looks like a piece of Skylab or something, you know, uh, bigger than the building. Or just you go, you, you block up with some material. You, you know, nobody wants that. Because we have inside of us, I think, an instinct or uh, something, that an impulse that says, man, that's just not what, that doesn't work, right? Nobody gets that. Uh, people can get uh, revitalized properties, right? The Main Street programs and historic preservation over this time that I've been talking about have been very effective tools for planning uh, in, in Kentucky. As you can imagine, once the economy turned, these numbers have changed some, but the concepts are still the same and it does still work. So I'm only showing you up to 2012. Uh, $129 million in investments across the state that are directly because of the Main Street program. Some of those are public investments back when the monies were there. You get renaissance, you get other ways of funding historic preservation along your commercial corridors, etc. Um, and then you get then a pretty large amount of money in private investment, right, where people will match that um, and, and build into it. And if you narrow it down into the 4th District, which is how the state divides up its statistics, you still see it's pretty viable. You know, in this district, there's uh, in that same time period, what, $25 million worth of historic preservation or Main Street related investments, right? Some of that coming through public funds and, and then through private funds. So we have to say, well, we shouldn't just kick historic preservation and Main Streets to the corner even just because you know we, we see a downturn in the economy. If it comes back, these things can thrive. And I think that's what will happen. So <clears throat> it stands to reason then that I came up in historic preservation not as an environmentalist conservation guy, right, but a guy who is looking at historic preservation as a way to spur on economic redevelopment a way to get preservation involved in communities and get communities to support historic preservation endeavors, whatever they might be. It could be anything from the Rab House uh, to the community and community tapestry things that we've seen come along. All of those are fair game for historic preservation, right? That's why Sand and I can talk about it for hours and a half. Uh, there's other ways to do it too, you know, just looking at reinvesting, working with people, get this word can't out of their vocabulary, right? Uh, break down, as it were, this negative perception of, of any of that. <clears throat> so how's this working out for us? Right now, there's a couple of dozen projects within the historic district. The historic district accounts for about 350 buildings. Um, some commercial, some residential, mixed use, some that aren't as historic as others, some that aren't really pretty, and some that are, you know, it's a mix of a lot of stuff. And that's what you want. That's what makes it work. It's what makes it value, valuable to me, is to see uh, different perceptions or different periods of time, different attitudes about architecture, different attitudes about culture, and all of this. It makes it wonderful, right? And the real thing here, Right now, there's about $2 million, the best estimate I could come up with, of people reinvesting uh, into their properties right now just within the historic district. Uh, you're supposed to have that look on your face, you know. That's really good, man. Just think about that, right? People willing to spend that much money to rehabilitate um, or adaptively reuse a historic building in, in your community. Now, an economist would say, well, that translates to, to jobs, right? It, uh, if you're improving the property, you're also improving your real estate values. Uh, there's a whole lot of ways you can start breaking this down, and there's guys that do. If you've ever gone to see Donovan Ripkin talk, that's his whole speech, right, is the economic value of historic preservation as a jobs creator and an economic engine. Um, 
Lots of other ways I could talk about this. Uh, I won't bore you. If you wanted to take a, a history class with me, maybe we would talk more about them. Again, you could look at real estate and historic preservation. You could break this down to niche-oriented shops along the main street, which I think we should. Has anybody ever been to Lawrence, Kansas, Kansas University? Yeah, Lawrence, Kansas is so good at this, it's ridiculous. Uh, well, I'd like to just pick up what they're doing and just set it down right here. You know, uh, the, when it comes to the niche-oriented shops, these are the shops that people will come to because they can't find them anywhere else, right? You want to attract that to your commercial corridor. Um, there's an enormous opportunity for second-story residential development in uh, Main Street area, too. Uh, it's tricky to work through that because of the zoning and uh, code enforcement regulations, rather. But it can be done, and we have some people doing it. Community outreach, um, historic preservation and community go together. You cannot have effective historic preservation if you don't have community support, right? And so that's what I'm trying to do every day, build the community support so that it makes sense to people. You get it. There's a lot of ways we could deal with this, right? <clears throat> but the real goal in all of it for me is the quality of life issue. When people come to this town, they are going to recognize there's a certain quality of life in the town or not. <laughs> and one of the places they look the most to see that is your downtown. Uh, but not necessarily. They can go through these neighborhoods. Uh, you know, these real estate agents, they sell these historic houses because people love them. And they will work on them and they will fix them up. You're doing one right now. You know, um, uh, it's just a great thing. So we want to uh, maintain and preserve the quality of life, right, for those who live in this historic district and it's worth the investment. Absolutely. Yes? So. <clears throat> Changing the perception of people, right, remains my highest priority. And I want you to help, okay? I want you to tell a positive story when you talk to people, right? Let's get away from the word can't. Just say, go see Fred. We're going to find, we're going to find a way to help you out. Yes? So work with, like I said, I expect, I expect this Sunday at church, I'll, I should feel something, right? Because I'm going to be on some prayer lists out there, right? Uh, one of the things I'm working to do is to something that's behind the scenes, but it's effective in how we can understand and deal with the historic district and to talk about it, especially from a municipal standpoint and the ways in which it work, operates as a regulatory device. And that is to bring this thing up to the standards of 2014. Right, which is really a technological statement. Uh, and we, if you hang out with me, I'll eventually show you what I do here. And we just received a grant um, to redo our historic district guidelines uh, because we bump into all kinds of issues that we would like to work with people on, but we're restricted by the guidelines. And the conventions have changed in historic preservation enough to say we need to change our guidelines to be current with what the conventions for windows, the conventions for siding, the conventions are presently in terms of materials and design and workmanship, all these things that are really important to how we can make decisions and hopefully help people do their projects, right? And then last is in the future as we go forward and uh, uh, Julia gets my job after she graduates uh, that what we will have done is is created a place that people can celebrate uh, that they can feel proud of and that they know their investment is a good one and that can be investment of their time volunteers you know the investment of uh, how they view the school system everything you can think of can be t tied up to this thing called investment, right? And when you, when you have a nice investment, you want to feel good about it, right? Yes, I do. Uh, so we all have to work at that. Change the perception and uh, we'll make this district work and get away from this word can't. So unless there's any questions or comments, thank you so much for this meltdown <laughs> of technology, whatever it was, but thank you to Jim Cleveland and uh, James and Sanda for your quick timing. All right, your hands went up together. Okay, go ahead. I, I think I, I agree with your perception, total uh, idea. I, uh, I think it's, there's more here than the bottom line number on the spreadsheet. Though. Yeah. 
there, there are a lot of number of people that, all, that are on both sides of this fence. And you can, I have found in my business <coughs> that you can, and, and this goes back to Louisville during the Harvey Sloan administration, when I first started getting involved in this in the late 70s, early 70s, that you could hire an engineer all day long to show you why it's not worth saving from an investment standpoint. I get this all the time. Uh, and, 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 and I think a real critical question is here, do you want to save it? And why? Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons why you should. Uh, when, when I, and, and this happens to me constantly, Fred, when, when I, and, and people hire me um, to make that decision for them, and it gets, it, it comes down to this question, do you want to save it? And, you, you know, and then of course you get into the resources of that, that process. But every building that I have bought in the years that I've been in this, uh, especially in the last couple of years in this community, they were buildings that were slated to be torn down. Those buildings on 6th Street were history. Um, the building, that little Victorian on Main Street, people were trying to tear that down. It wasn't been for a, a, a number of people, but the woman that owned that and her steadfastness owned it. I mean, granted, she really didn't know what she was doing, but she did hold fast to that thing, wouldn't let it go. And when I bought it, people came up to me, and this was the question they asked me. Do you really think you can save that building? <laughs> There's a, there is an incredible need for education here. It's just incredible. And it's not just in the community. It's with people that are holding an office that should are that should be aware of. And, and uh, I, I, I think it's, um, it, when I told you it was uh, preservation of life, uh, I really meant that because I think I, th I think it's uh, I think it's more than the bottom line, and, and uh, uh, you have to. Look so I don't know if anybody's ever messed with ten foot high gigantic windows, uh, but it's a real project, a really expensive thing to have to try to undertake. Uh, and the other problem he's facing right now is the lentils, which are those ledges that run across the base of the window. Uh, those are sandstone and have been in there, well, what, about 100 years now or something. Uh, those are all going to have to come out, and he's going to reinstall uh, sandstone specifically cut just for that, the same thing. That's expensive. Uh, and to find the craftsman that can come in, work around those windows and get the lentils back in and get all of that fixed back up is a real challenge. But, you know, when you see Ben, pat him on the back because I tell you, he probably loses a lot of sleep. Um, and then you have uh, Tory across the street from there. I don't know if any of you have been in Tory's uh, uh, facility that he just redid. It is magnificent, man. Go inside that thing. It's just awesome. Uh, he's getting ready to, It's uh, if you don't know which building it is, it's the second floor of the Mexican restaurant that's on Main Street. The new project is next. Well, it's, it, the, new pro, the one he just finished is over the restaurant. He's got another piece of that project cooking over in the next building over. Those two buildings kind of um, uh, you can cross over from the interior piece of it. Um, I don't think Tory minds me sharing because he seemed pretty happy to talk about it. He's invested over $350,000 so far into those properties. That's what it takes. I'll tell you the other thing it takes is a young generation who's, who's willing to make the investment for their long-term benefit because it's the only way it's going to pay off, right? Uh, and so with Ben and Tory, they're just the kind of people you want. You want that generation that's willing to make that long-term investment. Um, so encourage them, you know. And I think they're going to do more. I think Tory's trying his best to get those burned-out lots that are there. He, and if he gets them, we'll see something happen because he's not going to let any grass grow. Um, I know you have a project going on down there that's a restoration of... Uh, 
it's a, it's um, I'm confusing that with Andriots. Andriots is 1101. I can't think of the address that you're at down there. This is, we're putting a little addition on here. It's 1101. Yeah. It's 1416. 1416. Um, it's next to James. That one had a big hollowed out interior that um, last time I saw it, a bunch of cats were hanging out. Um, you know, and so on. Yeah, we're saving one. Right. So this is another of these project of love because most people would say tear it down, right? So you, you're the guy for the job. Um, Andriots is pretty expensive. He's have you been up there to see that 1101 main? Uh, he's gutted that thing and uh, additions and all kinds of good stuff happening. Um, Blue Gables, Charles, and I don't want to over talk you guys. I mean, you could, I look forward to your all's presentations, man, on these properties at some time. But I know that that's, you guys have made a substantial investment in buying that property and you've got a long road ahead of you, it looks like. But little step at a time, you know. Maybe somebody pushing you. I don't know how, how that's going to work, but uh, that's it, James. I don't want to bore these people to death, but yes. I think the most important things you can do, though, is what you were saying earlier, is that for so many years people have heard the word. Pain. Oh yeah. Without someone saying, <clears throat> "Well, you can't do that. That's not suitable." But here are the other possibilities. Mm -hmm. That there, are, there are several possibilities, and not just a complete no sure. and then go away. Sure. So, yeah. I hope. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's still the that's why you guys need to go like get some signs, run down the street, you know, hear ye. Uh, yeah, it's the people don't get it. So it's broken. Examples of what what you and your board are doing to to Assist. communicate to the folks who own property in the district mm -hmm. to to get the more positive word out. What mm -hmm. are some examples of that? This. Uh, and I've done several talks that are similar to this uh, to try to um, have a little bit of an awareness thing. I do get to spend one-on-one -on -one time with people, and I'll tell them the same. I don't mind saying, hey, let's tell a positive story here. I know that there's been an a era here where things haven't been so pleasant in some ways, but you guys accomplished a lot in that same time period. Let's talk about that. Uh, let's talk about what is good about it. Uh, you know, we live in a culture today, I call it the cult of negativity, uh, where, you know, everybody just proud members of this cult, uh, where the only thing they want to do is beat everybody up. What's the deal with that? You know? So I don't want to do that. I want to say, hey, man, great job. Let's get you sign up. When I'm at the museum and I love to talk to people when they come in, you know, I like to give them a welcome. But you would be amazed at the number of people who are a man, really love our town because of the way it looks. Oh, yeah. And that the preservation of the buildings, and they can see we have a sense of pride. And that's pretty much what we're about, is pride. And I think the historic district does a great job, and we thank you for your efforts mm. in keeping us going. Well, no, no it's problem. It's a sense of pride that you love what you have, and it's a treasure. <clears throat> and so... Yeah. That's whatever it takes to get it there. I, I think we've done a remarkable job over the 20 some odd years. Oh, yeah. It has its ups and downs. Sure. Fires don't help. <laughs> no, not a bit. They don't help a lot. A lot of people out of town, too, enjoy coming to Shelby. All the research I do, talking to people in other states and all over Kentucky and Louisville, they say, I love Shelbyville. I love the way it looks. She's mm -hmm. on there. They, you're, we're yeah. making a, a stand. Yeah. And you know, I remember that fire on 6th Street. Yes. That was the impetus to get this whole thing started. That's what started. That's what did it. Yeah. Lucy was on the everybody was quite council, good. and Neil was mayor, and that was a tough time because mm -hmm. it could have gone. Well, <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> but it worked out, didn't it? 
All right, sir. We finally are going to make it to your question, and I am so sorry. I just been patiently listening. You have. That's awesome. Uh, I have a little building over on. Uh, I've changed that. Gilmore Dutton has a building that, that I rent, and uh, we put uh, some signs on the window. One said "Historic Kentucky," and the other one said "Back Home, Kentucky." And your predecessor arrived and said, "You can't do that." And I said, well, Gail, the problem is those signs are already up. And uh, she said, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to grandfather that in. Because mm -hmm. it was obviously a fait accompli. Uh, and I think the real bugaboo about the historic commission has been, you know, the can't is the enforcement. People really don't understand what enforcement powers. Uh, I know they blocked uh, Neil up on... Uh, I guess that's 10th uh, of Main. He wanted to put a sign out, have a big sign, and they blocked that. So you might explain just briefly uh, what enforcement powers the Historic Commission has. Okay. Uh, basically, it's by the ordinance, and it's linked to some extent through code enforcement because they are really the enforcement agent uh, in anything not in everything, but in a lot of what we do. If it literally has to be enforced, um, it would go to them. They, they are the enforcement. But what we have is the power by ordinance, like I can go on to people's properties. I can actually go in a, someone's property. I can't imagine doing that personally. Um, but um, I'd, I'd say it's pretty limited, the, the amount of teeth that's in our ordinance, because you don't really need to double dip it. If I have something that if it's a violation in our, by our guidelines, that means it's a code violation. And I can turn it over to code enforcement and they can enforce that violation. So that's really the way to use that tool. And unfortunately, there, would be, there will be times when that, you just get people that aren't going to be players. Uh, no matter what, unfortunately. Uh, and, and there's going to be times when that's necessary. But I will tell you, I think it should be very rare. Um, I think that most people, if you get a chance to sit down, be reasonable with them. Uh, and by the way, uh, have you, who in here has been thoroughly cussed out by somebody for something somebody else did? I mean, they didn't miss... A lick, man. I mean, like this thing was well rehearsed, right? Uh, just the shiniest, cleanest cuss words you can put on it, right? And just lathered me up with it, right? There's so, we got to get rid of that kind of thing here, man. That's just people have this venom in them about this. Uh, but it is a regulatory job, so it does come with regulatory devices that sometimes we're going to have to exercise those to, um, to enforce or otherwise insist that something occur. Fortunately, in the two years I've been here, that has not really been the case, um, and I've been able to work, work through it with people. You're doing a good job. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.